Yes. Well, welcome this morning, especially if you're visiting. Love to have you. Quiz picture up first. <clears throat> who's, whose hand on that hammer is? Whose hand, hand on the hammer? Who's, whose hand on the hammer? If I had a hammer, I, I'd hammer on the Wittenberg door church. Of the, yeah, okay. Walter Martin. No, it's, it's, it's Martin Luther. Yeah. And I put that up there because uh, it was October 31st, which is what today is, that uh, he decided to... Uh, a nail on the door of the Wittenberg Church there in Wittenberg, Germany. And uh, basically, uh, it's what's called today 95 Theses. I would call it 95 Bones to Pick with the church. And, uh, and he, he did that. He, he put it up there. And so uh, some churches actually celebrate today, October 31st, not as Halloween, but as Reformation Day, because that's when he stuck those up there and said, listen, I got a problem with the Pope and the rest of the church, and the church has gone into a, ca- a crazy place. And, and Luther had... Uh, Luther was a man who'd read the Word really well. He'd read the Bible. He knew the Bible well. You could only get the Bible in one translation, Latin. You could get it in Latin. And so the church used that as a way of keeping people from reading it. But even if they, if, even if they had copies, most people didn't speak Latin. Most people didn't read. So, but Luther had both those. He read it and said, you know what? What I read in the Bible and what I see in Christendom don't match. I've had enough of this. We need to kind of, you know... Call him on the carpet about it. And so, uh, have you ever read his 95 Theses? I, I thought I'd put one of them up there because it's really remarkable when you look at it. Uh, here it is right here. It's number 86. This is, this is why it's a bone to pick in your face. Why does the Pope, whose wealth today is greater than the wealth of the richest Crassus, build the Basilica of St. Peter with the money of poor believers rather than with his own money? Hmm? <clears throat> yeah, it was... There's a, even worse ones in there. So at the time, the church had been in the process of taking money from people, especially very poor people. And uh, I was saying, if you, if you give us money, you can buy an indulgence. And with that spiritual money, you will buy uh, someone to get out of, you know, to get into heaven, basically, yeah, whether it's for yourself or for your relative. So poor people actually were in the process of scraping together every dime they could get out of their poor income to hopefully pay for the salvation of their relatives and themselves. And then Luther said, that's just wrong. That's, I mean, that's nowhere in the Bible. And a couple other one of his theses, he says, listen, God saves not by money we pay, not by money that we pay on our behalf or anyone else's behalf. God saves on the basis of his grace toward us and we avail of ourselves through faith. So that's just wrong. So he was uh, very much in your face. So he got excommunicated. <clears throat> well, anyway, so anyway, that's uh, Martin Luther. Uh, that was 1517. And, uh, and people who, bel- who followed his basic rebellion against the central Christian church and followed Luther and his adherence to the Bible came to be called Lutherans. Lutherans. Yeah, <laughs> they were called everything. I mean, it started a, it started a whole realm of, uh, of change. So anyway... That's to him. Now, we, we come to the Word today because of the same thing. It turns out that he says, listen, we, we live by what's in the Word. In fact, here's a great quote from him. I want to give you one more because I think it's just marvelous. He says, unless I am convinced by proofs from Scriptures or by plain and clear reasons and arguments, I can and will not retract, for it is neither safe nor wise to do anything against conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. So for him, show me in the Word. Show me in the Word. Show me in the Word. If it's not in the Word, it's not for me. And uh, that's kind of where we're at today. We, we live that same legacy. But it's not just the legacy of Luther. It's the legacy of all, all true Christians who've said, if it's in God's Word, where Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will never pass away. So we say, okay, what's in His Word? Let's read His Word. So today we come back to 1 John, and that's why we're in His Word, so we can understand what it says. So here's our key verse in 1 John. Now that key verse near the end of the chapter, he summarizes for us why he even wrote the little letter. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Have you memorized this verse yet? I'm going to try this out. We just read it every every Sunday for the entire fall and winter, so sooner or later we'll get there. I haven't yet, but we'll try it. So that's why we're here. Just like Luther, we're saying, let's see what's in the Word. And the Word John is writing is telling us, is giving an assurance that we can know that we have eternal life. So we come to a new chapter today uh, about that whole thing. Another evidence, which to me, 
as I went into it, I thought, well, this is like a no-brainer chapter, but after a while, see, it happens to you. You act like that, and God messes with you. And he says, no, 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 no. So well, let's see if we can discover that together, because this is, this is different. Let me show you where we left last week. We left with this verse in chapter 3, verse 10, where he said, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. So you can, in any crowd of people, you can use this one criteria and you'll be able to separate the children of God from the children of the devil, right? So I'll make a chart right here. Very simple. You got the children of God, the children of the devil. And here's how we can tell. He says, anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. So well, that makes sense. So no righteous behavior. Nor the one who does not love his brother. Okay, so the no lovers. So that's easy. You get in a room of people, people who don't walk in righteousness, which is... Uh, how God would act and reveal his character and his nature in actual actions. That's righteousness. Anyone who doesn't act like that and does not love is a child of the devil, not the child of God. But he didn't tell us this left side. So we're going to try and fill in this left side today. So what is a child of God? Uh, in a proactive way, not just what it's not. So here we go. He goes into verse 11 and says, okay, so here you go. This is the message which you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Wow. Did you already know that? See, that's why I came to this chapter and said, yeah, we love people. Okay, what's next? Well, it's not quite like, he, he, let me give him a little more time here. And then he says, verse 12, not as Cain, who is the evil one, and slew his brother. Well, duh. <laughs> So, I, I mean, I've read this and I thought, and you know, I don't want to be disrespectful, but when he says we're supposed to love and not love like Cain loved, well, Cain didn't love. He killed his brother. Cain and Abel, Cain came after him and smashed his head in. So, okay, I won't love like that then. He, he's getting at something else here. I mean, let's give him a little bit more traction and see if he can, he can do it for us. And for what reason did he slay him? Huh? Cain slew his brother Abel, and why did he slay him? And he tells us. It says, because... His deeds were evil, Cain's deeds were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Okay, you remember the story? In fact, we'll get to the story in just a second here. So Cain does not love his brother because his brother has been acknowledged as doing righteous, good things, and Cain has not. And so Cain gets mad and kills Abel. But now why is he bringing this up right here? If one of the indicators of a real child of God is love, and he says, so don't love like Cain loved his brother by loving him to death. No, that doesn't make any sense. So he, he, he's bringing us somewhere we don't know. It's a kind of an odd thing. And the next verse starts to open up what this is making him think about in terms of the very generic, you know, the vanilla idea about loving people. There, there's more going on here. Look what he goes to next, because this is, this is uh, insightful. Um, I just thought I'd throw this picture up. It's kind of cool. If you want to read more about it and we don't have time this morning, go to Genesis 4. Uh, the whole story of Cain and Abel is only those eight verses right there. It'll take you all of about 15 seconds to read, okay? But there he is killing, killing his brother Abel. Um, <coughs> Hebrews 11 says, uh, verse 4, By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. Uh, so you notice the reason why Abel was right and Cain was wrong was because of that little word, faith, by faith. So, you know, if you know the story of Cain and Abel, you know that Cain and Abel both gave an offering to God. Uh, Abel was a uh, tiller of the ground. Cain was a guy who dealt with animals, basically. They both gave an offering in kind of what they did. Abel's was accepted, Cain's was not. And Cain gets mad about that and he kills his brother. And many people have said, well, that seems very arbitrary on God's part, don't you think? I mean, after all, is it God saying, I only will accept anything grown in the ground? I'll take carrots and potatoes and beets this week, but I won't take goats and sheep and oxen? No, that's not the point at all, because we know that does work for sacrifice later on. The issue, the writer of Hebrews says, isn't the nature of the offering. It's the heart of the offerer, okay? Abel did it in faith. Cain did not. And he, and he does it a little bit more later on in Hebrews down here in verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So the issue between Cain and Abel's offerings, why one was accepted and one wasn't, wasn't, wasn't animal, vegetable, mineral problems. It was a heart of faith. And it was a heart issue that was the problem. So that's why Cain kills Abel. But why would Cain get mad at his brother because he did the sacrifice right? I mean, wouldn't you just say, oh, well, you know, I guess I misunderstood what I was supposed to do. I'll go back and do it right. 
But Cain is so ticked, he kills his brother. He kills his brother. And if you know anything about sibling rivalry, it's one thing when you, well, I'll, I'll talk about my brothers. I have two brothers, you know, and we were, there was always a certain kind of sibling rivalry. We were very close in age. There were three of us born in four years span of time. So there was always a rivalry that went on. And it was one thing when you all did stupid stuff and bad and your parents in an equal-handed manner said, bad, bad, bad. And we'd go, yes, 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 bad, bad, bad. But if they went bad, bad, good, huh? Then us on the bad side would go, Cain-like. Right? So that was the problem Cain had. It was the fact that God looked at Abel and his sacrifice and said, good, well done, acceptable, righteous. And he said to Cain, not good, bad. And he got really mad. Now, now if you read you back to Genesis, you'll see that God talks to them for a while and says, you know, you can reverse this. Uh, you don't get angry about this. There's a way you can go back. And he gives them actually a, a good chunk of that passage to say, come on, get your act together. Don't worry about him. You can do well. And then the next blink of an eye, Cain takes Abel out to go talk to him, and he's dead. So Cain doesn't follow that. So here's what it is. Cain is basically ticked at his brother and kills him because God had favor on Abel when God would not have favor on Cain. And that ticked Cain off because he did everything he could do from the religious perspective, everything right, and he was still called wrong. And the fact that God said yes to Abel just ticked him off. In a sense, if you want to expand it, it's man-made religion ticked off at God-made religion. Heart of faith is acceptable to God, but it wasn't with Cain. So see, that's what we're talking about here. Um, So what we're going to do through this is we're going to talk about what real love is, a real righteous kind of love, uh, and, uh, and I think that will start to give us an understanding about what he's talking about when he just says the children of God love. Because... When you put that in your head, I don't, I'm not sure it gets any less fuzzy than just to say it's love. I mean, what does it look like? What does this kind of love look like? And I will maintain that the reason that he brings up Cain and Abel is because the kind of love he's asking us to do may get us killed. What? I thought all love was something that everyone loved. All you need is love. Right? So if, if you're committed to a life of love how, and righteous love reflecting, reflecting God, how would you ever get under anyone's skin and they'd be mad enough to want to kill you? And yet, Abel did enough right from a faithful, righteous heart that out of jealousy, Cain killed him. I think that's what he's going to get at here. So we're going to flesh this out a little bit. So here we go. Verse 13. He actually says it straight up. Now don't be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Okay, wait a second. You, you, I, I'll go with that. You know, I'll go with that. But he's talking in the context of love. We're, as children of God, we're supposed to love. So don't be surprised, brethren, you children of God who love, if the world hates you. You see the problem right here? It, it doesn't make any sense. You should say, brethren, if you love, 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 sacrificially, everyone will notice it, and they'll love you, and they'll say, oh, what a wonderful person they are, and they won't have a nasty bone in their body against you. They'll just love you in response. Woo! Right? But he's saying, don't be surprised. If you're a child of God and you love in the way God wants to love through you, they may not like you. Jesus is a great example. Jesus embodied the fullest life expression of love from God, and where did that get him? On the cross. So start working on this for a second, because this is the kind of love we're talking about. We're not just talking about a manby pamby cultural-derived kind of love. We're talking about something that is so cutting-edge and so unlike the culture we're in, it'll actually tick people off out of jealousy from man-made religion. Because that's where Cain's coming from, okay? So just, just start working on that because this is, this is what smacked me in the face and I had to slow down this week. I'm like, oh, okay, wait a second. I don't think I even half understand what he's talking about, but I'm sort of getting there. Okay, so we're going to make our real love list. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. We know that we've passed out of death into life. Because we love love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. And everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So I'll just put up this first characteristic up here. First characteristic is that this love that he's calling us to not only attracts people because it's unlike anything else, but it also will anger some people. 
And I think that, that by itself is something that we have absolutely no intuition about. And yet, go back to our intuition about what happened to Jesus. Perfect expression of love. And yet he died. And who are the ones who got mad at Jesus that killed him? The religious Pharisees. They're the ones. It wasn't the people that he reached down and touched when they didn't deserve it and he healed them. It wasn't the blind man who could see. <clears throat> it wasn't the young girl who was brought back from the dead or the parents of her. It wasn't any of those people who, who, who murdered Jesus. The ones who murdered Jesus were the ones who said, he is a competition to us. He seems to be getting all the affirmation from God and the people. We don't like that. We are the religious establishment. We're the ones who should be getting the accolades for doing good because we do good all the time. Not him. It's actually religious jealousy is what it is. The older brother of the prodigal son. Repent. The prodigal son comes back. Repentant. Heart change. Is accepted by the loving father. And yet the, son, the older son is on the outs. You know, so, so really, when, when you walk in righteousness, and especially the manifestation of righteous love, don't expect that the world's response is going to be warm and fuzzy. With the people who receive that love, yes. But the people that think you're in the wrong religion and are actually jealous about the fact that somehow you're demonstrating the nature of God and his presence, they will be really ticked off. It, you see why this is such... A foreign subject? I, I mean, I can't even conceive of this, but it's true. We can, we, it goes everywhere. So it will attract as well as anger some. Um, also, he says, and I love this, uh, he who does not love abides in death. A life that's committed to a self-service rather than a loving, outgoing kind of nature is really just consumed in death. There's, there's death. There's no life in that kind of life. There's only life, it seems like, when you give yourself away in true love toward other people. See, remember, love, love from a New Testament definition, agape love, is a love that is, uh, that is consumed and overwhelmed with the best of another person, not your own best. It's saying it's not all about me, it's all about you. That's what it's all about. It's, a, it's, all, it's totally other-oriented, which is why you can see why that's very unnatural here, because we're born very selfish-oriented. And we talk about new babies, track their record. As soon as they're born, selfish-oriented. And unless Jesus grabs you in your life, you will remain selfish-oriented and live basically in death the rest of your life. So it's a horrible existence. So there's something that, that God says that, you know, if you pour yourself out for the benefit of, the others, of others, basically empty yourself of resources and attention that you think would, could be better spent on you and make you happy. But if you, if you say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pour myself out for somebody else. In the losing of your life for someone else, you find life. It's the great paradox of the Bible. And it's the paradox of the nature of God himself in his pouring out on our behalf and, and losing his life in Jesus. He finds his greatest blessing, and so do we. That's astonishing. So that's what we're going to do. The other thing I think it's astonishing to point out as we go along here, um, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that a murderer has, has no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. A, 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 a eternal life abiding in him right now, abiding in him right now not eternal life there aka heaven but right now has no eternal life so he's he's giving us this understanding that eternal life isn't something we just wait for after we die and find ourselves in some wonderful heaven kingdom eternal life is something that starts right now it's a part it can be in you right now and we know that's true as soon as he comes in his spirit and abides within us we find a new kind of life how it's the best way to describe this new kind of life it's like life that's timeless, like maybe eternal life, starting right now and into all eternity. So that, it's a new quality of that. The other thing I want you to notice, which I think is just astonishing, uh, is in verse 15, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Does that ring any bells from things Jesus said? Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Jeff read it for, it this, mor- read it for us this morning. It basically says, you know, you may have restrained your hands from killing people, but if you hate them, you might as well be murdering them. You just haven't had the opportunity yet. So, uh, so anyone who bears this kind of hateful attitude is a murderer. A murderer says, in reality, my existence would be better if you didn't exist at all. And someone who hates says, 
my existence would be better if you didn't exist at all. It's exactly the same thing. It's just that you haven't wiped them off the face of the earth yet. By the way, hate can manifest itself when you say it that way. My existence would be best if you didn't exist at all. If you completely um, ostracize someone or, or exile them or ignore them or walk past them, I mean, inattention to someone deliberately can be as devastating a form of hate as lashing out at them and screaming and, and hurting them. Because you're basically saying, my universe is over here, your marine universe is over there, stay in your universe, because my existence would be better if you don't even exist, so stay away. One other little side note, and this manifests itself more often with us, <coughs> is the fact that many times we exist in our relationships with other people, dividing the line between people we want in our universe and people we want out of our universe. Are they people in my universe? That is, do they serve me? Do they make me happy? Do they make my universe, you know, stay calm and okay and, and they serve me basically and I like them having here? And if they don't, can I exile them to some other universe because I really don't want them to be part of my world? I say that's a softer form of loving and hating. Because loving says, I want you in my universe as much as possible. Even if it means nothing for me, even if I get no benefit, I want you in my universe so I can love you. Hating someone says, be gone, cast away as far as possible. And so uh, unfortunately in a lot of life, we walk through life, whether it's in church or whether it's in school, whether it's in social circles, trying to figure out who's in my universe and who's not in my universe. And if you've been deeply wounded in your recent past or even your long past, you'll always be playing this game of looking at people like, are they an in-my-universe person or an out-of-my-universe person? Are they capable of hurting me like people have hurt me in the past? Because if they are capable of hurting me like people in my past, I just assume relegate them to some other universe. Has anyone done this or is this just me? Anyway, those are actual manifestations of love versus hate. Love versus hate. I don't think that when Jesus walked this planet, there was ever a person he walked by and said, I'd rather have you not be in my presence at all. That, that was love. That was accepting him into his presence. That's what we do, accepting all. So if you're in this game, still in this game of dividing the world between people who like me and people who don't, people I want in my universe and people I don't, recognize that when you exile them to another universe, you've just done hating. I wish you didn't even exist. That's how little I care for your presence with me. Bye, go over there. That's hate. That's actually hate. Okay, too much conviction in the beginning of the talk. Here we go, let's move on. <clears throat> he goes on, verse 16. Now we know love by this. What is love? Okay, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Ah, <sighs> thanks. Finally, a concrete definition. What is love? What love is to say, like Jesus did, it's not about me. If I can give my life, all that I have, for your benefit, that's what I'm going to do. That's love. It has not a single ounce of me. It has everything to do with you. That's what love is. Committed to the best of somebody else. And by the way, it, it really is uh, more an act of the will than it is a response to your emotions. So it's, it's not always the fact where someone, you know, God says you need to love them. And you say, yeah, but, you know, I just don't feel it yet. You know, they, if I could feel it, then I'd, then I'd love them. But I just don't feel it yet. I mean, I fell in love, and I felt that, and I responded, but I don't feel this love. I'm waiting to fall in love, and then I'll respond. Does anyone hence sense that in culture? Because <clears throat> in popular culture, love is something that happens to you as an emotional thing. Somehow you're dropped into this vat of gooey, wonderful, warm love, and then it makes you do crazy, loving, best things for the other person. So as long as I'm emotionally incapable of fighting it, and it's forcing me to do great things for this other person and not think of myself, that would be wonderful. But that only happens about this much in life, and God uses that to give you, I think, a taste for what living for someone else is all about. But Jesus loved people that didn't love him. He loved the people who were unlovable. And so why this is so remarkable is because God says, I want you to love and have no thought to yourself to the people that no one else in the world will pay an ounce of time for. They're, they're unlovable. They have, they have no worth to me. I'm not going to pour any of myself into them. That's uncharacteristic love, to love people that are unlovable. Okay? 
So we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. By the way, uh, he says brethren, which doesn't mean strangers. Now, he, now we are to love strangers. Jesus says your enemies, your enemies. You got to love your enemies. But here he's, he's emphasizing brethren. That's, that's us. That's the people in this room. He's telling us we need to love each other in this room. Well, we love each other in this room, don't we? Well, mostly we do. But not all the time. You know, the people that you're closest to and spend the most time with, it's the most difficult many times to love because you know more about them. Sometimes it's much easier for me to love a stranger. Hi, where are you from? Oh, great, can I buy you lunch? Then the people that you know, oh, hi, hi, how's it going? Uh Right? Or uh, a little ditty, let's see if I can remember this. A, A pastor of mine from years ago, 30, 40 years ago, um, he used to say this, he used to say, to dwell above with saints we love, oh, that will be such glory. But to dwell below with saints we know, well, that's another story. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of what we're talking about. It's, isn't that cute? He used to, boy, he used to say this like every other sermon. I thought, oh, I'm with you, I'm with you. So, so that's the deal. We need to love the brethren. These are the people that we, that we need to love because we're the closest to them and we're most tempted not to love or to take them for granted, or to keep them out of our universe because they're full of problems, and I'd rather not shoulder their burdens with us. So, Okay, let's move on. Uh, he says, basically, it's selfless and it's sacrificial, just like Jesus. It has very little to do with falling into love. It has everything to do with committing ourselves to the best for someone else. Verse 17, okay. Where, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? So another clue is the fact that it meets needs. If you have the love of God inside you, and we were talking about this in Sunday school, and you see someone in need, well, you don't have love abiding in you if that love does not manifest itself in meeting their need. Oh, yes, I do love you. Good luck with that problem you've got. Bye. That's not love. That's love in words. That's not love in actions. So it's, it's sacrificial, it's selfless, and it looks to meet needs. And those needs may be costly to you. And in fact, if it costs you nothing, it's not sacrificial, right? When David was, when David was tasked with finding a place to build the temple in Jerusalem in the, new, in the, the town he went to in this new city that was going to be the center of God's place and, and he's going to build this temple, this wonderful place, uh, he finds this piece of ground and this piece of ground, which is today actually where you'll find the Dome of the Rock in that part of Jerusalem. He found this ground. It was a threshing floor that a guy used to kind of separate wheat and chaff. And the guy who owned the ground said, oh, here, let me just give you this land. I'll, I'll just give you this land, oh, King David. Use it to make this temple of everything. It'll be wonderful. And David shot a glance back to him and said, no, because I will not give to God what cost me nothing. It must be costly. I need to pay you for it. So love toward God from David was something that's costly. Love toward others is often going to be costly. And in the costliness of it makes it wonderful. If it's free, it's not really sacrificial. Um, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Just like he says, it's got to be more than talk. It's got to be more than saying, I'm a loving person. It's got to be a life that says, that's a loving person, right there. During their time and in our time, we're plagued with people who say one thing and do another. If you want to find out what someone really is inside, see what they do, not what they say. That That was good in the first century, that's good today as well. We can amplify it a little bit more. If you want to see what a person is really like inside, see what they do when no one else is looking. Then you'll understand. Okay? So not just what they say, but what they do. Okay, he goes on. This real love. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Uh, what he's saying right here is that this kind of love that's manifest in our life assures our heart in front of him. And it's very simply, he's reiterating what he talked about last week, which was, if you see the nature of God uh, replicating itself in a transformed, regenerative life that you have, if you see that coming out of you, then you know that you're a child of God. You know you're, you're of him in that particular sense. It assures your heart, even if your heart condemns you about all the other nasty things you do. And we all have a fair share of nasty things we do. But if you see this impossible love coming from the inside of you, then you can know that there's a regeneration that's only explainable through the indwelling of God himself and the fact that he's made you his child. So you can have that kind of assurance in front of God. You know, God would say, why should I let you into my heaven? Well, for one thing, I'm your child. You gave birth to me. But another, you know, in that birthing, I seem to, I seem to be 
showing these evidences of who you are coming out of me. God is love, and where that came from, I don't know. I found myself loving people I thought I'd never be able to love in my entire life. That assures my heart that there's something transformative that's happened that only he could do. So that assures my heart. Let's move on. Verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask him, ask we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. Well, 21 is an extension of what he just talked about, the confidence we have. And then he goes on and says, you know, we can ask whatever we want and, and he'll do it basically. We'll receive from him because we keep his commandments and the things that are pleasing in his sight. In a way, he's saying that we, we evidence obedience. We seem to keep his commandments. There's something about what he's asked us to do that still comes out of us. And not because, like we said last week, we stick it on you know, the barren limbs of our tree and hope that we become an apple tree by sticking false apples on us. It's not that matter of, 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 of applying good works to our outside to look like our nature is different. It's actually a matter of having our nature reveal fruit. By their fruit, you'll know them, is what he's saying. Well, here, right here, he's saying basically the same kind of thing. We find ourselves obedient to the things he's commanded us. Jesus said, if you'll love me, you'll obey me. You'll do my commandments. Wow. Does that mean that I will not be loving him if I don't obey, if I don't do his commandments? I, I have to work at obeying or else I'm not loving him? Jesus, I'm loving you today because I'm walking this old lady across the street. I'm loving you, Jesus. No, it's the other way around. It's the fact that I'm changed inside and that obedience is something I want to do. Uh, Paul says that, that God himself is at work within you to will and to do his good pleasure. He, he's the one who's working in you to do that. That's that regeneration. It comes out of you when, you re, when you're reborn. That's why John so emphasized this new birth. We talked about it last week. You have to get born all over again from a new parent. Your new parent? God the Father. And in that transformation process, when you're reborn, you're given a new nature and everything is different. It's a new life. Paul says the old life is gone, the new life has come. Just like when you're reborn. So it's very much like that, he's saying. That's this new birth, this new internal change will result in obedience and it's more like an adherence to the things of who God is and what's important to him. You go, ah, I love that too. Read David when he writes some of the Psalms. He writes about God's, uh, God's law and says, I just love God's law. I, oh gosh, the, God's words are just a treasure to me. I just embrace them and love them. Read Psalm 119 uh, and 118 as well. They'll do that. So he says, I love that. Well, it, it, everything that's about God, when we are regenerated and we're born of him, everything about him, including what's important to him and how you act in life, are extraordinarily important to us because our new lives are starting to generate that. Now, to be fair, if you, if you analyze your life right now and you say, well, I'm not seeing a whole lot of that yet, yeah, be patient because God's working that out in you. He will take you through some sieves in life to start building those things. And you will, with time, grow more and more in love with God and who God is and the nature of his commandments. And, and, and those commandments are just a reflection of who he is. And righteousness itself. You actually fall in love with good and you start to be absolutely repulsed by evil rather than playing with it and allowing it to be. It's, it's an extraordinary process. So he's doing that. Just be patient. He's doing that. But go to him and say, God, I want to see, I want to see more of that regeneration. I want to see more of you remade inside me because I am so in love with who you are and what makes you who you are. By the way, we're studying in the Adult Sunday School book by John Stott, and it's called The Radical Disciple. And this word disciple, we don't, we don't talk about much anymore, but from a Greek sense, a disciple, it was usually a young man who would look at an older, mature man and say, you know what, everything he says I find extremely wise. Everything about how he, how he runs his life, I find I want to replicate. I want to be, when I grow up, just like him. I want my entire life to be who he is and what he represents. And so you'd have people who would follow Aristotle and Plato. They'd be disciples. They'd hang on every word because they want to be like him. They, the things that, that make that man who he is, they want to incorporate in their life. And so when the apostles use that same word for us, we look to Jesus and say, we're in love with him. Everything about who he is and what he is, we want in our life. We want that to eclipse everything who we are. We want the old us to fall away. We want to be just like him because we're in love with him. I'm in love with his love is what I say lots of times. When I see Jesus interact with certain people in the New Testament, I fall in love with that love. I really do. And uh, I could tell you a whole bunch of instances in the New Testament that bring me to tears every time. I love Jesus because I love his love. 
And I want that in my life too. That's what a disciple is, to follow him. Okay, he's obedient. <clears throat> so what is this commandment he says? We do his commandments. Just right then as you're reading John's word, letter, you're thinking his commandments. So if you were going to make a mental list, of what you know are Jesus' commandments to you in the New Testament. What would that list look like? Love. Oh, boy, you guys are cheating again. You're reading this stuff. Yeah, because, you know, it, it's funny. When you, uh, when you rewind the tape of what you've read about in the Gospels and you see Jesus doing stuff, how often does he say, do this, 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 do this? Not very frequently. But there is one he does that's very strong, and he really pins it down at the end of his life when he's with the apostles. And, and John reminds us, because John was listening that day. Verse 23, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Commanded us to love. And we looked at this either last week or week before. It's not a new commandment. It's been around since the early parts of Israel, Deuteronomy 6. I mean, it's been around a long time. The issue, they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. It's all about love. All you need is love. So it really is about love. It's committing yourself. It's about being not about me for the rest of my life. It's about someone else. It's about what's best for God and his agenda, his will. Not my will, but your will be done. That's loving God. You know? Not what I want, but what you want. That's loving your man. So it's really, it's a, it's a not me existence now. That's what this is all about. So he's saying right here, that's the commandment. That's what we love to obey. That's what we can't even stop ourselves because this regeneration process God's doing inside of us, that's what he's doing in us. He, he's helping us to figure out how to love. And that love is more spontaneous. It's more part of us every day. And when we exhibit Cain-like behavior, we're more repulsed by it and say, God, I don't, I don't like that. That's a carryover from my old life. I want that eradicated. Can you erase that? That's just ugly. I hate that. I don't want that to be part of who I am. I want to be like you. Will you make me like you? So it's really just a yielding to the process that he's already started. He's the author and finisher of your faith. He's the one that started in you. He's the one that's working it out. And he's going to do that inside of you. The other commandment before that is what? No, on here. On here. That's true too, Steve, but right there. To believe. Yeah. That's, that's the commandment. Jesus does literally say this. You know, he says, if, if you want to narrow it all down, it's belief in me is, is everything. It's everything. Now, what does belief mean? I mean, historically, we believe he was a real person, right? He walked on the streets of Jerusalem. Uh, he had a real life around, you know, 30 AD or something like that. Uh, there's a lot of dispute that go on in the world right now. Well, you believe in a different Jesus than we do. Blah, 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 blah. No, I think we believe in the same Jesus. That same guy who showed up back, you know, turn of the century. We all believe in that same guy. Well, no one disputes that. But we, all, we all agree on the historical nature of who Jesus was. A remarkable person, without doubt, without argument, a remarkable person who showed up in the first century and after he left, huge tidal waves of cultural change and people change happened. There's no doubt that this guy really came. You'd be an idiot to try and say he never existed because historically there's not a single person in the history of mankind who is better documented than the presence of Jesus. Historically, he came. So that's just off the board in terms of debate. And Satan believes in him too, yeah. So, so that's not the debate. The debate is, who is he really? I mean, he was a real person that came, but was he more than just some guy who showed up, did a three-year public ministry and changed stuff? Was he more than that? Who did he claim to be? Before Abraham was, I am. That was at the end of John 8 last week. Did you guys go back and read that? Then they picked up the stones and said, that's blasphemy, because no one can say that unless they're God. Right, exactly. So is Jesus who he said he was? Those who say no, don't believe in him. Those who say yes, believe him. It literally is, I believe what he said. I believe what he said about himself. Now, if he is God come in the flesh, God, that same creator who made this entire place, there's a whole bunch of strings attached. If God the creator comes and visits his creation, there's a whole bunch of, uh, okay, then that raises a thousand other questions. Like, why would he come and visit his creation? What was the purpose of him coming and making, you know, a guest appearance in the midst of his creation? He must have had some reason for that. Why did he come? So uh, 
a lot of those things, well, we know it's for salvation, to bring salvation, to equip us to be part of his kingdom later on. Sinless creatures that would be his handiwork, not our own handiwork. And we all, we all know this kind of stuff. But in believing who Jesus is, you just can't, I mean, it's, it's impossible to say, Jesus, is he's the Messiah promised from eternity past through all Israel and also the King of kings and Lord of lords and also the highest total authority and also the creator of the universe. Is that the guy? Oh, I think so too. So what do you want to do today? There's, there's a huge follow on if you believe who he is. And that's why we've given our lives to him and follow him because he is who he says he is. That's what belief is. It's not just agreeing that he was some historical figure. It's far beyond that. He is the ultimate authority and the, and the one to whom every human being who's ever existed will stand in front of a judgment. Him. He's the only one. That's how ultimate his authority is. You, you mean this carpenter who was born out of wedlock to Mary and Joseph? Are you telling me that guy? Yeah, that's the guy. For sure. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's what I say. When you say believe, it's a mouthful. It's not just historical. That's the commandment. You need to believe. And he commanded that mankind has to believe who he is. And if you don't, Jesus says, you're already judged. It's like judgment is kind of a redundant exercise, he says, because if you already uh, don't believe who I am, he says, you've judged yourself because that's the commandment and you broke it. Yeah, Jesus says that actually himself. You're already judged before we can get to judgment. Okay, so real love not only attracts and angers some, it's selfish, it's sacrificial, it meets needs, uh, it's costly, it's more than just talk, uh, it assures our heart because we see God regenerating himself inside us, it's obedient because we love him, because it's an inside out kind of nature thing. So how is it, how is it physically possible to do that? If you're adding that to your list this morning and say, okay, I guess I better start tomorrow and love differently, I'm going to put this on my list, here we go you'll fail. You'll fail. Because <laughs> you know what? You're built more like Cain than you are like Abel. Because when you see people doing good and you miss the opportunity, it'll make you mad. There's, there's more Cain in you than you, than you want to believe. It's a problem. So how is this possible? John answers this too for us. Ah, this is what he says. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Someone abides in you. And that someone is God himself. In fact, when he's using the him pronoun, he's, he's meaning Jesus. But he's meaning Jesus as part of the Trinity God, God himself. And you, and you know it for sure. You have evidence because his spirit is there. So how are you supposed to do this? You abide in him. He abides in you. And this new life, we called it last week, spiritual DNA, works its way out in your life and suddenly you're living a whole new life because he's in you. He's in you. He's in you. That's what the regeneration is all about. If Jesus just came to give us a list of things to do and give us a really hard list of things to do and said, good luck with that. I hope you get there. I'd love to see you in eternity, but who knows? I'll see what you do. It's not, that's not how it goes. Believe who I am. Believe that I am the eternal God. The first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega who died on your behalf to take care of the problem of your own sin which you created and now you're going to die for. But now justice has to be served. I died on your behalf. Now you can be part of my kingdom. And now I live in you, abide in you, and reconstruct you from the inside out. Whoo! I mean, that's, that's extraordinarily good news. Like I mentioned last week, this, that whole process is what we call regeneration. It's starting over. It's, start, it's being reborn. This transformation, this regeneration that he engineers and that he empowers and that he does through you, it's his responsibility. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He'll get us there. He's the one that's doing that in us. If there isn't a transformation going on, even a tiny bit, I'd ask the Lord, what are, you, are you there anywhere? Because I want you to abide in me. I, I, don't, I don't want this old flesh life that I've got. I want this new man who's the result of a new birth. I want that transformation. I'm tired with sin. He does it uh, in us. It turns out it says, his commandments abide in him and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit who has given us. Now the abide word, before we go on, I always have to redefine it because you don't use it a lot. 
It's a word that just means to say, this is where I'm staying put. I'm parking right here. You know, instead of, instead of roving around and saying, I don't know where I'm going to rest, I don't know where I'm going to plop down in terms of what I believe or I don't believe, I finally found what I can settle in. I'm staying put right here. That's dwell. That's the abide. I mean, it, it's, a, it's deliberately in contrast of flaking around and moving all over the place. It's to say, this is the spot, we're staying right here. Okay? You made that decision with God. In God, revealed in Jesus, that's where I'm planting for the rest of my life. And I'm not going to wander from there. I'm not, this is where I'm staying. I'm sticking. I'm abiding right here. And God said the same thing about you. Great, because I'm going to stay in you as well. Oh, wow. Wow. It's very much like marriage. And this is a metaphor that he uses in very powerful ways, where the two people in the marriage say, I've been wandering around all my life, never really settled anywhere, but now I'm going to settle here. Will you settle with me? Okay, I will do. And you settle together. And you decide mutually to settle together. And that's what God has made the proposal to us. He says, will you settle in me? And we say, yes, we'll settle in you. He says, great, because I'll settle with you too. Exactly like that. In the Old Testament, it was always put, if you'll be my people, I'll be your God. Let's settle down together. What do you say? Unfortunately, Israel was not a great spouse. They were unfaithful, and they, went, they, they unabided. And they were looking for other gods that would please them and make them happy. And God just stood on the side here, just waiting. He let them wander. He never let them find any kind of satisfaction until finally he said, you know, I'm still here. If you'll be my people, I'll be your God. Well, we're not sure yet. Whee! Woo! Canaanites, woo! Right? Idolatry, everything. And finally they come back to him and they say, we want to abide in you. He says, great. I've always been here. I've been the faithful husband to you. I'm yours. So that's what he's talking about. That's the only way it's possible is if he abides in you and his spirit through us enables us to do that. And then he regenerates our hearts and recreates himself through us. Okay, next week. We're going to continue in 1 John. First, yeah, chapter 4. And he's going to hit this topic right here. Look out, look out, look out, look out. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. You don't know any false prophets? We'll hazard a guess next week. <laughs> but it's by way of saying you live in a dangerous place and you need to be equipped to deal in that dangerous place with people who talk as though they're mine, but in reality, they're not at all. They're not at all. It's his, it's his continuing series of not only telling us what's counterfeit Christianity in us, but what's counterfeit Christianity in others that are close by. And don't underestimate them. There's great danger there. So you need to be equipped. So we'll talk about that next week. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Okay. I'll do it in you. Whew, thanks. <laughs> I'm a jerk. And that's the good message about 1 John 3. Exactly that. Okay, let's pray. Father, we do indeed thank you for, for choosing to abide in us as we chose to abide in you. I, I still admit, Lord, I can't, I can't fully fathom that. It's, it's, still, um, it's still a great mystery in the dimension of it. How can, how can you, the creator, who's outside of creation, come and abide in me? That seems to be a pretty intimate place. And, and, that, and I guess that's your point. That is the place where we meet inside us. Lord, thank you for, for coming and dying on our behalf. And thank you for undertaking this great renewal project in us to put away the old person with its flesh and its self-centeredness, its greed, its hatefulness, its depravity, and recreating in us you. Lord, that's just astonishing. We look at you in Christ and we fall in love with you and everything about you and, and who you are is so dear to us. And because of that, you're remaking yourself in us because you've called us your child. You brought us into your family. You call us your children. 
and, and such we are. <laughs> so Lord, we thank you for your great loving kindness shown to us. We thank you that even when we didn't deserve it, you died for us. Even while we were still in rebellion, you died for us. When there was so little to love and so much to despise, that you died for us. And you remade us and uh, changed us from being those street urchins to your adopted children. You wiped off our face and you remade us from the inside out. And you draw us closer to you every day. Lord, we, we uh, recommit to you now. We've, we have stopped wandering. We, we're settled in you. There is nowhere else. No one else has the words of eternal life. No one else loves us like you do. Where else would we go? Uh, only you and you alone we have in heaven and earth. So Lord, we're yours and we are so pleased to be called yours and what an honor, what a grace to be called your children. And Lord, our hearts rest and abide in that. So thank you for calling us yours. We'll ever always be in your debt and we'll always be marveling at it. So thank you now in Jesus' name, amen.